Let me ask you a question. Have you ever wanted to dome someone with a rocket to pop watermelon? Well, I bet you do now. Such is the promise of this bizarre little Japanese indie game called Full Stay. Every so often something comes along that really challenges my preconceptions that I have about living, being alive, experiencing reality. Something that really throws a wrench into the inner workings of my mind. An experience that shakes my understanding of our universe casually and without bravado. I was going about my business as usual when suddenly a spirit whispers in my ear, you don't really know what's going on down here, do you? That spirit, that whisper on the wind, that enigma is Pulse Day. Okay, but seriously, what is this game? Here, I'll show you the title screen. That, that clears things up, right? You get it now. All right, well, my job here's done. Please subscribe, have a great day. Fun. Full Stay is an early access game made by a one-man indie dev, and you could perhaps describe it as a hikikomori simulator slash brawler slash base defense slash schizophrenia empathy therapy. Look, even attempting to describe this is difficult, so bear with me here. In this game, you play as a series of robots made by Susumu, the main character. Susumu is a hopeless neat, or by the Japanese term, a hikikomori. So what exactly is a hikikomori? Well, they're people that spend almost the entirety of their lives in their tiny apartments, leaving only to get food, or sometimes never leaving at all. They spend their days in solitude, passing their time away on the internet, watching anime, playing video games, or what have you. What exactly causes people to become like this isn't exactly understood. It's a well-known fact Japan's work culture is brutal, so perhaps the pressure of that is enough. Or it could just be social anxiety dialed up to the max. Or my personal favorite theory is that the standards of life are ever declining, but work seems to stay the same. Home ownership is out of the question for my generation, and even owning a vehicle is becoming an almost unbearable financial hurdle. Perhaps Hikikomori's are more perceptive than the average person. And perhaps they just see the deal on the table and say, Nah, I'm not playing that hand. I'm dropping out of society. I'm gonna curl up under my blankie and watch 12 episodes of anime in a row. So basically, you're like a couple of bad days away from being one of these, so be nice. I'm just kidding, but I know life is hard. That's why for 12 easy monthly payments of 99 cents, I will personally send you a birthday message telling you that I believe in you. Now, I'm going to attempt to describe the gameplay loop, so do your best to keep up. Susumu has created you, Robo, to help mitigate the profound difficulties of his life choices and his social anxieties. For some unknown reason, his house is constantly beset upon by random people that are attempting to disrupt Susumu's solitude. Now, I don't know who's bankrolling him, but he's got a pretty nice place. He hangs out on the upper floor, and you have to defend against assailants that come from the east and west. They'll spawn in waves, with multiple waves in every stage. It's your job as Robo-chan to help prevent any and all home invaders from reaching your master, and you do that with a variety of tools. First of all, despite being fashioned in the image of a creator, you're actually quite capable in hand-to-hand -hand combat. You're easily able to crush any attacker in a one-on-one, -on -one, but they're not just going to 1v1 you. These guys are always swarming from both directions, so Robo's going to have to get creative. So what does getting creative entail? Well, you can instantly expand your house by adding new rooms in either direction, making the path the enemies have to take to get to your boss even longer. These rooms vary in style, and it's actually more than just feng shui here, because guess what? The real purpose of these rooms is to set traps. Now, obviously, Robo cares deeply about interior decorating, because certain traps can only go in certain rooms, because obviously the curtains have to match the drapes. So while you're playing Home Alone 6, I'm an adult Hikikomori man living in Japan, interior decorator edition, you have to think about what kind of traps complement each other and what to build where. So for instance, in a kitchen, I can set a homing pie trap activated by lasers. 
Or maybe I'll have a trap door that opens you up to fry you like a shrimp tempura. But I need a water source near the Japanese rooms because in those rooms, I can plant a watermelon seed that will grow into a RPW, rocket propelled watermelon. Rocket launcher. But I need to make sure it's being guarded properly. But Japanese rooms are also a good choice nearby Susumu because of the grilled fish trap, which takes time to cook your fish into rockets. But it's a fire and forget situation because they're auto targeting once launched. Or you could say, screw it. Guys only want one thing and it's disgusting and just throw out a body pillow. Ah uh, yes, my trap has been sprung. He's helpless. You can call that pillow Little Caesars cause it's hot and ready. Or better yet, an automatic whipping machine. Or, or maybe just a huge tube of toothpaste. You like that teeth paste? Get minty fresh, idiot. Now I know what you're thinking. How do you get the materials to build all of this cool shit? All right, come here, come with me. Okay, you see that? You see your neighbor's house over there? What's that made of? That's right, baby. We're an amateur demolition company in our spare time. Robo's ridiculous wrecking company. Now, I said you have to demolish in your spare time, and I meant it, because in between every wave of enemies, you only have a few seconds to earn fast stacks of timber at your side gig. But hey, wait, these, these enemies are getting harder. It's not just salarymen in suits. Now there's ramen chefs, karate kids, samurai, yakuza, middle-aged creeps wearing Sailor Moon cosplays? But wait, even the strangest enemy is still useful to you because you can learn new moves from them. At, at least, I think that's how you learn your moves. Honestly, I'm not sure there's a bit of a language barrier here, but I'm pretty sure every enemy teaches you some new technique. So as you play, Robo gets more and more adept at kicking ass. Let's sample some of his finer techniques. You can grab enemies and do the ultimate pile driver. You can grab them and do a, a rainbow? Whatever that is. You can also do a dogeza. And if he parries an attack in this pose, you can shoot around the room completely invincible, headbutting people over and over. But wait, these techniques aren't enough. I'm getting swarmed. Oh wait, I'm dead. Don't worry, it's just the robot afterlife. While you specifically might be a failure, perhaps the next model will be better. After confronting this thing, don't ask because I, I, I don't know. You're free to claim your place in the world of the living. Except don't take too long in hell because the clock is still ticking in real time. So I hope you set your traps up right. Okay, so why did we get our ass kicked? Well, we're a robot, so it stands to reason we need upgrades, right? And who better to upgrade you than your creator? If you're near the stairs, you can ask Susumu to build you some upgrades and also check on his progress in the meantime. But you have to juggle all of this, building, setting traps, demolishing your neighbor's shit, getting upgrades. All of it happens in real time with a mere 35 seconds between waves. So you have to manage every action's opportunity cost. Maybe if you set your traps super well, I can demolish and grab some materials while the mobs are slowed. And then I can build a bunch of extra rooms with traps so I can get more upgrades per wave. There's actual fun choices to be made and the game has surprising depth. And most of all, and most importantly, it's fun. Okay, we did it. We fought off the maniacs trying to break and enter. We've completed the first stage. Well, now you enter a first-person snacking minigame where you go downstairs to try to microwave a midnight treat. But oh no, home invaders want that treat too. So you got a finger gun blast them. Yeah, I don't, I don't really know what to tell you. That's, that's just what happens next. This game is so authentically bizarre. This profound strangeness deters attempting to understand it even at a base level. When I see some character model doing the wacky inflatable arm waving tube man, I'm less inclined to think of it as a glitch or lazy programming or whatever, and I'm more inclined to just be like, oh yeah, that's that guy, he just does that, that's his thing. It's sort of like, you ever meet someone who never does anything that's not obscured in like five different layers of irony? 
And then you want to call them out for being an annoying, pretentious wiener schnitzel, but you can't because they have a plausible deniability force field ready to deploy. Oh, bro, I just did that ironically, bro. This game is like that, except instead of irony, it's wacky glitches that I can't distinguish from the totally intentional, bizarre Japanese sense of humor. It's also different because this game is likable. Likable, but weird. Like, Japan-level weird. I kind of miss stuff like this. Way back in the past, we used to get weird like no one can stop Mr. Domino, which, yes, I will eventually do a whole video on someday, I just haven't found time. And stuff like Katamari Damacy, Mr. Mosquito, just these wacky games that would basically never get made in the West. And then, I don't know, it just seemed like it kind of dried up. Well, whatever reason for the drought of Japanese oddities is, Pulse Day brings it back in full force, because basically every 10 minutes, something absolutely incomprehensible happens. And the way it keeps me on my toes makes me yearn for every game to have this much soul and variety. The gameplay loop is amazing, because the basic premise is both fun and hilarious, and then it just interrupts you at random intervals to do something else fun and hilarious. I seriously love this game. Where have you been all my life, Pulse Day? Okay, so we've discussed the gameplay and how genuinely goofy and weird it is, but is there a method to this madness? Why are we doing this? Well, believe it or not, there is actually a story to this game. And guess what? I actually think it's a really heartfelt, genuine, touching, and compelling one. Which is weird, coming from me, as I complain about stories in games virtually every chance I get. My usual complaint is AAA games are overly pretentious, trying to trick me into thinking the story is deeper and more meaningful than it is, or it's the dumbest, most tired and cliched story you've ever heard. But Pulse Day? Well, I've heard Pulse Day's story zero times. Now, I want to dive into it, but first I should say spoilers here. I actually want you to support this game and experience it for yourself, so if you're interested in this game at all, just stop here, go play it, and then come back, otherwise you'll kill my watch time and YouTube throws this video in the garbage. But with that warning, heed it or not, let's jump into the meta-analysis. Okay, so first question, why are all these randos trying to break into Susumu's house? Uh, well, I can't answer that yet. Okay, well, what happens when they get to Susumu? Well, we can't answer that either because the dev himself doesn't know. Check out the Steam page, which perfectly sums it up. Are the attackers trying to harm Susumu? Are they coming to make fun of him? Maybe just observe him like an oddity in a human zoo. Well, you don't have to be a genius to understand that Susumu is suffering from absolutely crippling social anxiety and maybe more than a touch of the schizophrenia. Susumu's worldview is that every random person in the street is out to get him. His perception of the outside world as a hostile place leaks into every aspect of his being. During his waking hours, Susumu lives in constant fear of intruders, and in between the stages during the random nighttime events, we see that in the land of slumber, he doesn't fare much better. Even when he's getting a midnight snack, he's afraid of nocturnal home intruders. When he dreams, he dreams of bad memories of school. Susumu's mind truly is a troubled one. So as the game progresses, we get another random scene in between stages. Susumu rises at night and seems compelled to play a strange PC game. You control what looks like a malformed sumo and you shoot eggplants with the power of your mind at the other sumo to achieve dominance. Your only other option is to dash, which can be executed thusly. Now at first this seems like just another in a long stream of bizarre non sequiturs, but keep this in mind for later. Towards the final stages we actually see a memory Susumu has of being a child, presumably before being a shut-in where he expresses his childhood dream of becoming a robot. Now, scattered amongst the rooms of the house, we can see art that Susumu made as a child, illustrating his creativity and imagination. So moving forward, Susumu finally gets fed up with the daily assaults and decides to take matters into his own hands by hacking the Matrix. He discovers that these attackers are being mind-controlled by a tower emitting some sort of ray. Time to put a stop to all this. Now it's up to Robo to infiltrate the area and destroy the hateful tower once and for all. Robo has to fight through wave after wave of enemies moving towards the heart of the city. But then, suddenly, the game slows down, the music cuts out, and we have what may be my favorite bit of storytelling in the game. Robo must walk through a crowd of people all traveling in the opposite direction. These people, although clearly busy with their own personal affairs, will go out of their way to hit Robo if you get too close. But they're not going to actively pursue you and will de-aggro to continue on their way. Well, this is weird. Why did the enemy suddenly become less aggressive? Sadly, this is but a small insight into the mind of Susumu. Whatever's wrong with Susumu, the social anxiety or his strange interests, or maybe even just his physical appearance, causes even the most normal of people to go out of the way to kick him or punch him while he's down. If we extrapolate from this a little bit, I imagine Susumu, after years and years of getting strange looks or insults from strangers, has built up an understanding of the world as a completely hostile place. Even normal, everyday people want nothing to do with him and will harm him if given the opportunity. 
Okay, so after traveling through the Gauntlet of Humanity, the game gets a little more cerebral. We find a random photo booth in the rain, perhaps useful for taking a photo for a resume, which I guess is something you do in Japan. Upon going inside, Robo first sees himself, but then Susumu's face is revealed. Falling to the floor, we reach a subterranean area, or perhaps a representation of the inner psyche. We delve further in, finally coming face to face with... The sumo from the game earlier? Yeah, it turns out this big fat baby is Susumu's brainchild, Osan. Susumu himself was making that game that we played in the nightmare sequence. The sumo confronts Susumu, asking why he never finished his project. It had charm, despite being amateurish and unfinished. Why couldn't Susumu just complete the game and release him onto the internet? Susumu counters with your typical excuses that one might give. Excuses that I know you've made before. Why haven't you finished that project you're working on? How come that drawing or painting isn't done? Why didn't you finish composing that song? Why didn't you finish coding that game? And why did I have a hard time making this video? Susumu gets angry and demands to know where the mind control tower is, resulting in a boss battle. Once we defeat Osan, Susumu gets angrier and angrier. Osan then reveals the big twist. If you really want to destroy the machine, why haven't you already done it, Susumu? Osan asks why Susumu would destroy it since it's helped him so much. It helped him create the reality he believed. The machine is making people hostile, just like Susumu already believed they were. He has created his own reality. By turning his back on the world, he's forced the world to turn its back on him. The realization that Susumu has caused all his own problems is too much for his fragile mind, and he begins to self-destruct. Robo helplessly tries to defeat Osan while reality seems to be tumbling down. Then, we get another very strange boss battle where a broken and damaged Robo has to confront this thing. Whatever this thing is, it seems to have some sort of essence of a human binding it still. To be honest, I'm, I'm actually not completely sure what this sequence means or what it seems to represent. But whatever it may mean, upon defeating it, we get this scene. A bunch of Susumu silhouettes demanding Robo kill Osan. But Robo does not comply. Instead, embracing him and revealing his true form. Susumu's inner child, his creativity and joy for life that's been squashed, beaten down by life, his social anxieties, and even Susumu himself. Susumu then awakens, a new day dawning on him. No, he's not cured. Not yet. But he has a new resolve. A resolve to free his creativity and show the world what he can make. Let's do this. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, this story cuts deep. I deeply empathize with Susumu because you can tell this is an honest, heartfelt story. And if you haven't guessed it by now, pretty much autobiographical, this guy, Nito Soji, made this game. And there's actually a video with 13 million views about this guy's life. And if you want to, go check out his own channel. It's here. You can have some insights on what it means to be a hikikomori. Ups and downs. Now, I firmly believe in the human spirit and how humans connect to one another through honesty, and this game is definitely honest, so I hope you'll consider buying this game to support the vision of one man. Because not only is this an authentic, honest story, but it also happens to be a really fun game on top of everything else. Now, since I couldn't cram everything into this video in a coherent way, let's just take a look at some of my favorite stuff in no particular order. So a big highlight for me is the traps, obviously. And when you buy them, it can be difficult to predict what they might do based on the name alone. So when I bought video games, I didn't know what to expect. So I go to activate the trap as the waves come in, and what do you know, Robo sits down and his head falls off. Being a robot has its perks though, because I can pilot the head and search for power pellets, which, well, you might see where this is going now. Another trap, the whipping machine, will at some point randomly power up. Then, when it's in a special flashing state, you can interact with it and obtain a whip, which you get to use as a weapon temporarily running around a whipping ass Belmont style while it plays some Castlevania-esque music.
But there's also little details, like sometimes when Susumu is working on an upgrade for Robo, he'll just stop because he loses motivation and goes back to bed. To get him to start working again, you have to do these hilarious sequences where you wake him up with various instruments and beat some motivation into him. And then, perhaps the strangest trap of all, the body pillow. You saw this earlier, but there's another function. Once it has absorbed enough essence, you can hop inside and be transformed into a robo-magical girl, rampaging through the house and destroying everything in your wake. And then, finally, to top it off, sometimes when you leave your house, there'll be a convenience store, and sometimes a delinquent will be outside skipping school. Now, if you find this delinquent and talk to him, the game will actually switch to a first-person view, which is an absolutely psychotic way to play this game. But how funny is it that you have what is essentially an option you would check a box in a menu for most games, but in Pulse Day, you have to find some random delinquent and speak to him for the privilege of seeing the world in first person. Anyway, that's pretty much all I have to say about Pulse Day. This game is incredibly fun and it's basically a triumph of the human spirit. Now, I can't force you to do anything, but I highly, highly encourage you to go buy this right away. Also, if you're still watching, thanks, I appreciate it. If you do want to support the channel because I make terrible financial decisions, you can join, there's membership. Honestly, the best thing you can do for me is just watch another video and come back next time when I release the next video. And hey, it's free. Anyway, Doom Profit out for now. I'll catch you all in the next video.